Matthew here, your BRS beginner guru, and today in episode nine, we're talking nutrition. For too long, this hobby has asked the wrong questions. What's the best fish food? Or how many times a day should I feed my fish? They seem like good questions, but in fact, they led to malnourished, sick, and oftentimes dead fish. Just imagine having a farm with cows, pigs, horses, llamas, cats, and dogs, and asking the question, what is the best mammal food? It's just an inherently flawed question that we can see the problem with immediately. Each species on that farm needs a different diet and our fish and inverts are the same. The first step in this nutrition conversation is to ask the question, what is the best food for our Kamohara blennies, our pygmy filefish, our neon dottiebacks, our trochus snails, our hermit crabs? You get the idea. Luckily for us, my colleague Joss chose a stock list of easy to feed fish with similar diets. Really only the banded trochus snail and the variegated sea urchins need herbivorous food. Our fish and inverts will do well with a mix of dry and frozen food, but before we choose those foods, there are a couple things to consider. First is the size and filtration power of our tank. 40 gallons is really pretty small and we are relying on automatic water changes and a macroalgae refugium for nutrient export. If we're not careful, it will be easy to pollute this tank quickly, which will likely cause a nuisance algae outbreak. Second, we need to consider the nutrient density of various foods and which foods will provide the best nutrition to those fish while at the same time not adding in unnecessary nitrates and phosphates. Since we added fish and inverts last episode, our tank's bio load went from zero to 60 overnight. It's really important the first few weeks after adding fish to check our ammonia levels to make sure our biological filter can keep up with the new bio load. And on top of that, I'm gonna test every few days for nitrates and phosphates as well. Both are obviously going to increase, but what I'm looking for is a flattening of the curve. If that happens, that tells me that all of our filtration is able to keep up with the bio load. But if those nitrates and phosphates just keep skyrocketing, that means there's a nutrient imbalance and I'm gonna to have to up my filtration and lower my feeding. If my PO4 or phosphates gets crazy high, let's say somewhere above 0.3, I will likely perform a couple large water changes and then take a look at my foods and make adjustments so that the nutrient levels don't get so high. But I'm also hoping that as soon as my catomorpha really takes off and fills up that refugium, it will do a great job at consuming a lot of those nitrates and phosphates. Moving on to nutrient density, we're only gonna consider pellets and frozen food, although there are also some really good flake and freeze-dried foods out there as well. The simple truth is that pellet foods are astronomically more nutrient-dense by weight when compared to frozen foods. This means that pellet foods have the potential to deliver more nutrition in smaller amounts to our fish and inverts, but the downside is pellet food is much more likely to add unwanted nitrates and phosphates to our tank as well. Frozen foods, on the other hand, are way less likely to pollute our tank, and they don't contain any of the fillers that are common to pellet foods. In a small system like ours, frozen foods are going to be the primary means for providing nutrition while at the same time not polluting our tank. A couple other things to consider before choosing your food is the size of the fish and what they are used to eating. All of our fish are captive bred, so at least we know they are used to eating prepared non-live foods. But all of our fish are still really small with teeny tiny mouths, so they will need a small size food. So here is what we are feeding our livestock. Hikari Frozen Mysis Shrimp. There are other brands out there, but the smaller size of the Hikari Shrimp make it better for smaller fish. Piscine Energetics Calanus. It's just a great food for our fish. Super small, but high in protein and fat. The added astaxanthin will also help brighten the colors of our fish. The small pellet form of TDO Chroma Boost, one of the most widely used pellets in the hobby. The small size is great for our fish. 
And as an added bonus, I wouldn't be surprised if breeders also feed Chroma Boost. And then to supplement the diets for our two herbivores, we'll be feeding seaweed and Hikari algae wafers. But as long as we can see adequate film algae growing on the glass, we'll probably hold off on feeding those extras for now. How much food and how many times a day we should feed our tanks are two issues that beginners often get bad advice on. The usual advice is to feed your fish twice a day and as much as they can consume in two minutes. But to realize just how silly that advice is, just think about the different feeding habits between a panda bear and a boa constrictor. Pandas have to eat all day, every day, while boas can go weeks between feedings. The moral of the story is we need to tailor the amount we feed and how many times a day we feed to the specific livestock in our tank. Luckily for us, all of our livestock will actually do well with being fed twice a day. But we want to make sure that our food sticks around for more than two minutes so that our hermit crabs and our serra snails have some time to get some grub. We also don't want much of our food to end up in the filter socks because A, it won't be feeding our livestock, and B, it will just be decomposing and adding nitrates and phosphates to our tank. So here's how we feed this tank. We start by setting up a 15 minute feed mode on our Neptune Apex for our return pump and wave maker. But we also set a 10 minute feed timer delay on our return pump. That means after 15 minutes, the wave maker will turn back on, but the return pump won't for an additional 10 minutes. So I turn on our feed mode in the morning, feed a small amount of frozen mysis and calanus that I've mixed together in a cup, and add a small pinch of TDO Chroma Boost. Some food will fall to the sand bed for our goby, snails, and crabs, and the fish will pick at the rest. Then after 15 minutes, the wave makers will kick back on, causing all of that settled food to float around the tank, giving the fish a second chance at eating. 10 minutes later, any remaining food that really shouldn't be there at this point will go over the overflow and end up in the filter sock. I'll repeat this process once more each day in the afternoon. All of this sounds well and good, Matthew, but how will I know if I'm overfeeding? And on top of that, what do I do to make sure nuisance algae doesn't take over? Plus, you haven't even talked about tank maintenance or how to deal with evaporation effectively and easily. Pollution control and tank maintenance coming up in our next installment right here. And as always, everybody, thanks for watching. Happy reefing, be well, and we'll see you next time.